And folks, this is Harley Howard again. Welcome to another edition of the Committed 100 Ministry Lectures. Hope you had a great weekend in the Lord, at church, in your local fellowship. Hopefully the word was preached. Souls were blessed. that you're ready for another week of spiritual instruction from this ministry. This is the 27th lecture on the biblical church. And one of the aspects of the biblical church that is often ignored is the connection between the church and the home. I don't know how in the world that can be ignored because they both are so integral, such an integral part in the life of the believer. So I don't make that distinction that the home life is separate from the church life, is separate from the job, is separate from whatever. No, they're all part of the integration within the Christian life. And so we're looking at the woman of virtue in Proverbs 31. Um, Oftentimes when I've taught Proverbs 31 in the past, I've got the proverbial side eye for many women. It's usually the time when women sit and seethe and scowl because they um, make assumptions about themselves that frankly are not true. And since I'm not biased in regards to who I'm preaching to, um, if sisters are actually wanting to grow and to, to learn, um, there should be um, a joy associated with these teachings. And there should be an immediate repentance if need be. And there should be a desire to be all that God wants her to be. But of course, we always have to remember that the study of doctrine and theology require careful thinking and mental discipline, and that's why most Christians avoid them. And that applies to every truth, even the ones that we are prone to, uh, to ignore. So with that in mind, Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman? We're going to look at some points to ponder here. Number one, let us be careful not to forget that the instructions given, as well as the description of this virtuous woman, are all from a woman, from a mother of wisdom. And that's an interesting point because usually people are under the wrong impression that um, the virtuous woman was written by a man. No, it was written by a woman. And... I would assume that since it was written by a woman, um, that you would understand that she has perfect insight into that from which she speaks. So that's very important. She's pleading with the son, as we saw last time, not to get involved with worthless women and drunkenness, but to find a woman of virtue, a woman worthy to marry. Um, unfortunately, uh, a man will run to physical beauty infinitely quicker than for character any day. And there's no doubt about it in this culture by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, no one knows a woman better than a woman. And so since this again was written um, by a mother, um, a woman of wisdom, then the instructions that she gives should be should be heeded. Um, beauty and physical attractiveness and physical attributes, um, the way she walks, the way she talks, the way she flashes those eyes, that million dollar smile. Um, the fact of the matter is all those things are absolutely meaningless as far as virtue is concerned. In fact, those are the characteristics of vanity and deceit. And men sell themselves short when they refuse to find a woman of character. Let me say this. Um, 
the Bible says who can find a virtuous woman. It didn't say that a virtuous woman is putting herself out in the public, flirty and throwing all kinds of hints and trying to get attention to herself. That's not a virtuous woman. Um, that's a woman who's looking for trouble. Um, in, in fact, that's more of a woman. You look at that description of a woman in the book of Proverbs who's always trying to get attention to herself, and she's not the kind of woman uh, that uh, the Bible describes in any kind of praiseworthy way. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, outward character um, really affects nothing inwardly. If it's all outward beauty, uh, if it's all skin deep, as it were, um, these traps of physical and sexual abilities um, are used to get a man. There's no question about that. And they don't realize that the same traps they use will trap themselves um, as many affairs and divorce courts will testify. Or as the Proverbs themselves state in chapter 11, verse 22, as a jewel of gold and a swine snout, so is a fair woman, uh, which is without discretion. So the, the question again is, who can find a virtuous woman? Really? For her price is far above rubies. Um, who can find a virtuous woman? Hmm, interesting. The tense of the verb indicates that the search is still going on. In fact, it's my conviction the search never ends. Who can meet and find a woman of strength, character, and substance who can find a woman who is spiritual who is really spiritually minded devoted to god for crying out loud in our age you better believe she's rare because that's what the proverb has said the first thing that we need to see about a virtuous woman is that she is rare her value is far above precious stones she is a rarity which means, of course, that the virtuous woman is not common. Every woman is not a virtuous woman, even if she's a believer. Every Christian woman is not a virtuous woman. And I don't know why women do not um, ascribe to this virtue and seek this. And it's the only way you can do it is you have to be spiritually minded. Um, I've seen women of virtue um, growing up. They weren't spiritual women, but when you look at the characteristics of how they conducted their lives and their devotion to their husbands and families, that's a virtue because it, like the Proverbs describes here, is a rarity. In our culture, the entire family structure has been destroyed by design. And sad to say, unfortunately, we have fell right into the same trap. Uh, we failed to realize that the bombardment of visual and audio and uh, printed stimuli is designed to cause us to adapt the view about about the scriptures primarily about God's order of things um, to adapt a view which is the exact opposite. And now the women is being exalted again. The men are, are dogs, all men are pigs, all men are dogs. Women are everything. Children are an afterthought. We can kill them, we can do what we want with them, we don't care. And this is the culture that many young ladies are raised in. You know, when I was born in the 50s, you had a, a far different culture than you have now with, with uh, young boys, young girls growing up uh, in, you know, 21st century. Culture is far different. Um, but the Bible is the Bible. The Bible doesn't change according to the culture. And we still need to raise these kinds of young men and young women. And that begins in the home, which means the home life has to be tight. So again... A virtuous woman is rare. She's not common. She's rare. As rare as precious stones, as rare as could possibly be. 
So all women are not virtuous women, although all women who claim to be worshipers of God need to strive towards that end. Um, so again, this isn't something that um, that is just seen in Proverbs 31. Uh, not at all. There are other passages which teach the same thing. For example, Proverbs 12, 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. In other words, the proverb is saying here, the woman that brings shame or disgrace because of her disgraceful behavior and her attitude is as a rotten piece of worm-ridden wood. And you know the worm-ridden wood is of no value. The shameful wife strikes terror throughout the entire body of the husband because of how she acts, what she says, and her attitude. And she's busy tearing down her husband, both privately and publicly. She rips him apart by her words, her attitude, until he's ashamed to even be seen with her. Her refusal to be virtuous becomes that which eats away at the very soul of her husband, which is really horrible. And this goes on, sad to say, in a lot of professing believers' homes. I keep getting uh, messages from good young men who are pursuing either ministry or part of ministry or just want to have a happy home. They, they have a desire to do things for God. And this is this has been going on for decades now, and the wives are well, let's just say it, they're anything but virtuous. And they destroy the very soul of her husband. It's a sad thing to watch a man, young or old, but a young man in particular, who aspires to be uh, what he wants to be for God. And then to watch the very essence of his life get sucked out by ignorant, loud, um, blathering, sour attitude wife. It's a shame because she's self-centered. We're going to see that the virtuous woman is husband-centered. She makes sure that she understands the priority of her life is not extended family, it's not her girlfriends, it's not the job, it's her husband. And so if you see a woman claiming to be virtuous, and yet the husband is not the priority of her life, she's not virtuous. She's deceived. There are a lot more reasons for men leaving their wives and leaving their marriages than money or immorality. Oftentimes the wife's words, attitude, and actions are never seen in the light of the scriptures. Thus, they are never dealt with truthfully, and the real problem continues to persist until the marriage is toast. Um, and some just live under the same roof uh, with their mate. They don't want to have really anything to do with each other. Um, it's cheaper to keep her is the mentality years ago in some of the music. Uh, instead of getting rid of her, it's just cheaper to keep her. Just pretty much... You become roommates more than a husband and wife. Many wives are often very manipulative to get their way. In the process of getting their way, they destroy their husband's dignity, manhood, leadership before their children, if they have any. And in essence, you just tear your husband out, tear, tear him down, tear him, tear him apart. You create uh, an, an essence of rottenness in his life. Proverbs 19, 14 says, House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Um, the virtuous woman is out there. You just have to know what you want and to, to be in prayer about it. You're not going to find a virtuous woman in a pub, a nightclub, a strip joint, at work. It's just, and many, you're not going to find most of them at church. You better be in some serious prayer. Um, if you are to any degree looking for a wife, you want a wife, you know, that's going to be an asset to your life and ministry. You want a wife, you know, 
not only has your back, but she has you. Okay, you're the priority of her life. That she's not the priority of her life, that you are. You know, she doesn't complain about doing the things that she's supposed to do as a housewife, which is what Titus chapter 2 teaches. One of the reasons why we have so few women who have any household skills is because we don't have very many women who are of age that know anything themselves. And they think that they can teach a couple of lessons and, and, and that's it. No, most older women in churches are just as ungodly as many younger women. They don't have a spiritual maturity that's going to be attractive to any young woman who, who may want to learn. A woman of wisdom and virtue that is from the Lord, um, because that woman will fulfill God's plan for marriage. Um, if you want to look at an example of virtue, just look at Ruth's example. We're going to read chapter 3. I have it posted already up here for you. Verses 9 through 11 and three of the very significant lessons that her example teaches us about being virtuous. Number one, look at verse 9. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid. For thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Hmm. Interesting. Let's take a look at these lessons. Number one, she's a servant. If you look at her lifestyle, you see that she is a servant. She, she's not a servant with a motive. She's a servant from the heart. You don't have to tell her to serve. This is something that she is. That's why she's rare. That's why the book of Ruth is so small, because she's rare. It's just not a common thing to find this kind of a woman. Uh, the second point that she is kind and faithful. And like, like Boaz said, that she wasn't following young men, whether rich or poor. In other words, she wasn't a flirt. She wasn't chasing men looking for a husband. That's what a lot of young women do. They're, they're so busy throwing out feelers or bait uh, that they're just doing stuff to purposely um, try to attract a man. Um, the the makeup and hair and dress and shoes and all these entities are not in existence today um, without a purpose. Their purpose is to make you attractive, um, not for the purpose of looking nice for your job. Um, they're out there to try to tell you that you can get what you want uh, if you apply the right bait. And unfortunately, that's what happens. Uh, women, um, they're naive. They don't want to follow God's instruction. And they're following their desires and flesh. And, and they get caught up in the bait. And they put the bait on. They look totally different than what they do. Way beyond what they do. Um, besides their natural appearance. Uh, and the attitude goes along with it. And they go out, they go to their jobs, they go out to outings, they go with their girlfriends, whatever, and they're just flirts. And they're just trying to attract men. They're trying to look for a husband. That's not virtuous. That's not a virtuous woman. I'm talking about a virtuous woman, okay? I'm just saying what the text is saying. So, you know, as I've always said, if you have an issue with the text, take it up with the one who wrote it, and that's not me. So she's not looking for a husband or chasing rich guys or whatever. So she's, she's not vain, okay, looking for men and or possessions. Uh, she's not looking for the poor one either. You know, how some of these young ladies think they can change a man. They could, if they marry, you know, uh, the, the neighborhood slug, that somehow they have this inherent power uh, to change him into uh, a Prince Charming. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's a negative on that. That's a foolishness. That's what that is. Verse uh, 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 number three, her reputation was so impeccable that everyone in the entire city uh, that knew her all recognized that she was a virtuous woman. Now, every woman has a reputation. That's right. Every woman listening to me right now, you have a reputation. People have already sized you up and they have made their determination based upon observation, based upon your behavior, based upon how you conduct yourself, based upon how you talk, based upon how you treat your husband and your family, if you have one, or husband, if you have one, if you're single, the, the, the same kind of evaluations being made. And they've already concluded what you are based upon all those criteria. Do they recognize you as virtuous? Or do they recognize you as beautiful? Oh, she's so beautiful. Well, they could be referring only to the physical aspect of you. And usually that's pretty much what they do because that's what you show. You show a lot of physical beauty and they say, wow, she is beautiful. And that's true outwardly. But do they see you as a woman of virtue? That's the issue. Do they see you as someone who is committed to your husband, committed to your family? Because these are the things that are exactly opposite of our culture. Back to Proverbs 31 11. The heart of a husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. What does that mean? Well, he completely trusts in his wife. He doesn't worry about having any fears that she's going to destroy the home financially. You know, um, she's a manager of the, of the home. That's her responsibility. She's a, a home manager. Uh, she knows how to shop. Um, she works with her husband. She doesn't just arbitrarily go and do things without notifying her head. Now, that, that's not popular in our culture. And again, this isn't the issue of popularity. I don't care about popularity. And you should neither. Again, you, you need to stop being bombarded with all this junk that keeps trying to tell you God's plan is not the best plan. She's a true helpmeet. She is a help that is fitting for him. She does not waste the hard-earned income that is brought into the house. There's no need to tell others that your husband does not trust you. Okay, you don't need to go around telling people, I, I don't trust my husband. I don't know if I can trust my husband. Uh, here's a better question. Okay, can he trust you? That's the better question. You know, you want to get with your sisters or your relatives and badmouth your husband, tell you how much, tell them how much you don't trust and how bad he is and how this or that. The issue is, can he trust you? Because the verse clearly says, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Do you know if your husband from his heart trusts you? Can he trust you? The, the burden of proof is on you. Okay, based upon your lifestyle. And that's the question that needs to be asked and answered. Um, does he trust you? Um, a virtuous woman is one who can be trusted. Um, verse 12. Let me see how much time I got enough time. Verse 12 is very interesting as well. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. In other words, she is an asset to her husband. Let me just say this right from the start, and I'll repeat it again. Uh, the fact is that her number one goal in her household is her husband. She understands the, the lordship submission principle. She doesn't put her children first. She puts her husband first. Because clearly, the text is absolutely clear in all the New Testament regarding marriage, that the wife's number one goal in her household is her husband. 
She is an asset to her husband. She's not a liability. The words good and evil could mean agreeable and not disagreeable. She does not make it her aim to be a disagreeable influence in her husband's life. Her goal in life is to do her husband good all the days of her existence. Yeah, this is a rare find. You don't find this kind of woman nowadays. She's very rare. And I'll say it again. Don't ask your husband, are you a virtuous woman? Because if you have to ask the question, the answer is no. You already know whether you're one or not because you can read the Proverbs. You can read Ruth. So let's stop being like we're children. You know exactly what you are and you know exactly what you aren't. You don't have to ask anybody. You need to be asking the Lord by way of reading the text. Are you doing your husband good all the days of of your life? Excuse me, of your life. He's your priority. Are you doing that? Because if you're not doing it, it doesn't matter what others say or what you want to find out. Is that your goal in life? Is that your goal in life? Is to understand that your number one objective in your home is your husband. Is there any question about this? The goodness that a husband experiences in this life can be directly attributed to the virtue of his wife. I don't care what TV shows. I mean, what TV shows and reveals has nothing to do with scripture. The issue is, are we more inclined to believe television or the movies or the printed page or whatever other than what the Bible says? She enhances his life. She's supportive and encouraging to her husband all the days of her living. You can't do that if your husband is not your devotion. There are very few women that are devoted to their husbands. Very few. They put their family first. They put their friends first. And they put themselves first before the other two just mentioned. And she knows it. The minute the husband says something and she starts getting all flabbergasted and crazy about it. Well, that's the answer. He's not her goal. She's her goal. Others are her goal. Other things are her goal. And the husband is left pretty much to... Just fend for himself. You want to ask the question about virtue? You don't need to ask it at all. She can neither lift her husband to the heights or bring him down to ruins. It's up to her, really. A woman of virtue will be an encouragement to her husband. He'll never have to be concerned about, about that. She seeketh, verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. No one has to make her do anything. Now, she's not <sighs> blowing and carrying on when, when she sees her household uh, needs fixing. This is her role. This is her priority. She's not complaining about it. That's why she's rare. She's rare because very few women, very few women have this desire. She takes delight in working with her hands. In other words, she's not lazy. She enjoys making clothes for her family. I'll look at verse 14 because we're going to be out of time. Verse 14, she's like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. As a merchant ship brings tray from other countries, she is a good shopper, shrewd, a wise businesswoman, bringing many unusual and different things to enhance her home. Brethren, you don't want a woman who you have to waste time raising. You want a woman with some common and industrial sense. 
you don't have time to be a husband and raise a wife. You don't have time for that. That's what you do with children. You don't have time to raise a wife. You married some pretty girl and she's got about as much sense as a brick. You don't have time for that. You have to search for the best that God has to offer you. And that best is a virtuous woman. They're out there, but they're rare. It has nothing to do with the height of a skirt, the thickness of her legs, the beauty of her butt and all that junk and her assets and all this stuff that's being promoted and, and sought after by flesh. She has no character. Can't cook, can't clean, don't want to. Um, and you're never going to be her priority because the priority is going to be her because she wants to be with you to make sure that you give her the things that she wants to keep enhancing her. Real talk. Real talk. So handle it. And we're not done yet. Because this is something that uh, oftentimes um, is ignored. In, in this world now where you have a matriarchal society where in times past the, you had a patriarchal society where the, the man was the focus, was the head. Now women are rising up. They're taking over everything. And this is, this is ridiculous. And that influence is being just promoted. And men are being pummeled into nothing. They're being made to feel and look as though that there are, they are as guilty as the liars say that they are. I don't listen to them for one second as far as believing that rubbish. But unfortunately, uh, whoever controls the media controls the narrative and whoever controls the narrative controls the thinking. Well, if you want to keep listening to the lie, there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. Because no matter what I tell you, it's not going to matter anyway. And whatever God's telling you, you don't care. So if you want to keep being what you are, never grow, go for it. If you really want to be what God wants you to be, because down the road, when it comes to having to teach another young woman or young women the responsibilities of virtue, you can only do that if you were a virtuous woman. Then you could teach with conviction. Then you can teach with believability. Because trust me, young women are watching you. And they're imitating you. What kind of a, an example are you showing them? Not telling them. What are you showing them? Are, are they like you? Do you see yourself and your daughters? Do you see yourself and you go, I don't think I like that. Well... You're the one doing it. <laughs> There's nobody else but you. Yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow because it's Women's Day in the world. The woman is, she's roaring up a storm and every man's a pig and what have you. Whatever. Keep destroying your home. Keep ruining your life. I was reading an article just before I um, went on air that uh, young women now are are standing up against transgender men, women all win, winning all the, the track and field competition. Well, that's what you get for believing and adapting and tolerating foolishness. If you keep tolerating it, you, you're going to realize that, you know what, that freak ain't no woman. Well, you should have known that already because you, your brain should be working. But if you're going to try to erase all gender, and then create all these gender neutral nonsense other than a man or woman, what do you expect to happen? And all that is designed against God primarily. And sad to say that uh, many people, even in the, the alleged church, are falling for and believing the same lie. Well, I think that's it for me today, friends. I think we uh, pretty much have exhausted the time and I think I said enough as far as what needs to be said uh, in this regard. Tomorrow, of course, is spiritual discernment. Uh, and we're going to be talking about, again, the mind before and after the fall. Same time tomorrow, 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And uh, until then, 
May God richly bless you and may God keep you is my prayer.